This is Inside the Wolf's Den, an entrepreneurial journey with Sean and Joni Wolfswinkle. Welcome back to Inside the Wolf's Den with your host, Sean and Joni Wolfswinkle. Today we have a special guest with us, Eric Brewer. Hey, Eric, how are you? I'm good. How are you guys? Awesome. Thank you so much for joining us. So we met Eric but 10 years ago we're in a uh, mastermind together the collective genius so it's a mastermind that we talk often about here on the show but just to give you a little bio on eric so eric is the owner of cr property group he has bought and renovated and sold well over 2500 homes locally he utilizes extensive background and experience in the acquisition, re rehab, sales of real estate to grow the brand. Sorry, y'all, <laughs> tongue tied here. Eric's a 1993 graduate of York Suburban High School and served in the United States Army in the Avionics Division. He is a family man who also devoted to his children, Camden, Maya, Lily, Olivia, and his wife, Sonia. His greatest joy is the time spent with family and taking an active role in their education and athletics. He is driven by helping others and sponsors several local communities and youth programs, including but not limited to York Suburban Basketball and Boys Club of York City Raiders. Again, thanks so much, Eric, for joining us today. Why don't you get started with telling us a little your story, your background, how you got started in real estate? Sure. Um, it's funny, as I time goes on, the story becomes longer and longer. <laughs> As I get older, I'm trying to remember things that happened 20 years ago, not five years ago. But, and I think we were missing a kid uh, on this as well. Yeah, it, 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 <laughs> Sorry. It, it's, it's hard to keep up with me. If we talked again in six months, you'd probably be missing another one. But I mean, we didn't um, see, haven't seen you in like two years. So I know it's been a while and she's 18 months old. Oh, wow. So yeah, uh, her name is Sophia. I would hate for Sophia to to watch this, you know, yes. 10 years from now and feel like she got left out. So <laughs> thanks, Sean. You, Sophia. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. She is. Uh, thank you. But um, yeah, I, I got my start. Um, just like you said, out of high school, um, I sort of limped out of high school. I wasn't the best student in the world. Wasn't super excited about college, even though um, everybody that I went to school with was was doing it. Um, it just didn't feel like it was me. So I, I had a, a military family. And, um, my dad just encouraged me to go to the army. Um, and, uh, so I did, I didn't, I didn't have any other options. So <laughs> I went into the army, um, went in as a, you know, sort of a lost young man and came out, um, with some discipline and respect for authority and, um, a pretty good work ethic. And, um, so after I had, um, spent my time in the military, I came back home, um, and just kind of hung out for a little bit because my avionics, experience on working on military helicopters turns out didn't have much of a civilian application. <laughs> there, there were no helicopters to work on in York, Pennsylvania. So um, I went and uh, would go through the newspaper and worked a couple third shift jobs, which I hated. And eventually uh, went and applied for a job at a car dealership as a lot porter, which just meant I drove around Mercedes and Toyotas at the dealership, which I thought was super cool. And, uh, so I started there and um, really liked it. I had fun. It was a busy environment. Um, I got to drive cars and um, uh, there was a position that opened up at nighttime in their detail department. So when people come in to buy a car, um, someone had to clean it. So I was like, well, I'd like to make more money. Can I do that job? So I ended up, I would show up at the dealership at 7 a.m. for my lot porter job. And I would work till about 10 or 11 o'clock at night in the detail department. And after, I don't know, four or five months, the owner of the dealership was like, who's the guy that's always here? He said, <laughs> I, I come in in the morning and he's here. And I, I come back at night and he's here. Like, what is up with this dude? And uh, somebody said something, you know, about how hard I worked. And he said, well, we need someone in service. Why don't we make him a service manager? Hmm. So they came to me and were like, Hey, you know, we're going to teach you this new skill. You can make pretty good money. Um, you won't have to work till 11 o'clock at night anymore. And I said, okay, sounds good. So I was an assistant service manager for a while and did pretty good with that and caught the attention of the sales manager because most of the people that came back in the service had a good experience with me. Um, my average, what they tracked back then, repair order sales amount was higher than everybody else's. Turns out it was sales. I didn't realize it at the time. Um, so I got invited to, to be in sales and said, sure, why not? and got into sales and turns out I was pretty good at that and ended up being the salesman of the month um, 
it was every month that I was a salesperson. So from my first month to my last month, um, and I had no clue what I was doing when I started. (laughs) I I just had been so used to working so many hours and just talking to complete strangers. So I would just talk to everybody, bring them inside and the sales manager would close them. But so I got good at that. And then eventually management. And then um, after about five years of being there, I ended up being the general manager of the dealership and just got burned out. You know, after eight years, the car business um, back then was was very demanding. I was working 80 hours a week and uh, right around my eighth year, my son was born. And I just realized that I can either be a great sales manager, or I can be a great father. And for me, the choice was clear. I was going to be a great dad. Yeah. So decided to get out of the car business and didn't know what I was going to do next, but had saved some money and, you know, didn't need to go right back to work and just kind of chilled for a little bit and did some soul searching and ended up just saying, Hey, I'm good at sales. I understand a little bit about management. I'm pretty good at money. I understand that and finance. Where should I go next? And after doing some research, I was like, I think real estate would be good. And if I'm going to get into real estate, I think I should start in finance because that was something that, that, that at the dealership that I worked at, we were good at a lot of things, but we were great at finance and it, it, it consistently gave us an advantage. And we obviously mm-hmm. see that in real estate, right? Like our right. understanding of, of finance and private money and institutional lending and all that stuff gives us an advantage where sometimes we can buy a house because we can pay more because we have great lending, Mm -hmm. or we can sell it for a little bit more money because we can help the buyer understand or help them get more attractive financing, um, which allows us to maybe sell at a premium. So I did that. I basically was cold calling at a refi mortgage company, Mm. Um, wore a headset and just dialed into how's a cold caller pitching refis. Wow! And uh, turns out it was really good money and a lot less work than what I was used to doing at the car business. And I was like, this is freaking awesome. <laughs> but I, so I did that for like six months and was making a bunch of money. This was in like Oh five. And uh, you know, the refi boom rates were down and values were starting to climb up. Everybody was refinancing. And about six months after doing that, uh, the owner of the dealership that I used to work at called me and he had uh, sold the dealership at, I don't think he was 40 years old yet and wow. sold the dealership for a, a very large amount of money and thought he was going to retire and play golf. And um, turns out he, he, he wasn't able to do that. He, he was, he was anxious. He had a lot of gas in the tank. He loved working and uh, he was not happy being retired and stumbled across a radio ad for a house flipping school. Hmm. And he went to the house flipping school for like an open house and, and was super excited. It's like, oh, my God, this is just like flipping cars, <laughs> except instead of making 2000 on a car, you make 20000 on a house. So he called me out of the blue. We hadn't spoke since I had left the dealership. And even before that, because most of my interaction wasn't with him as the owner. Yeah. Um, but he was, the, he was the sales manager when I started there. So he was really the guy that gave me my break. And um, he's like, hey, I heard this commercial. I think we can flip houses. I know you're in real estate. And I was wondering if you might want to work together. So we had lunch the next day. We shook hands and got into business together and decided we were going to flip houses. And um, first year, we bought and sold 70 homes and had no idea what the heck we were doing. (laughs) But we were just really good salespeople. So we figured out a way to make money. And then uh, year over year, we we got a little bit better. We hired some people. We learned construction. We started doing direct to seller um, and we grew the business, you know, year over year to where we were doing 150, 200 deals from like our second year for nearly every year we were in business. And then after about five or six years of of doing that, um, he was ready to retire again. And um, I bought him out. And, um, so I've, I've been on my own since about 2014, 15, somewhere around there. And, um, now we have 45 plus employees. We'll do between 360 and 400 deals a year. Um, because of you guys, I do new construction and turnkey. (laughs) Awesome. Um, I couldn't spell turnkey before I got <laughs> genius. And uh, one, we did one of those, remember those forced, um, 
networking events where you had to pull your yeah, chair. Yeah. Yeah. And I sat across from, from Sean and we stared at each other for 30 seconds. <laughs> and I was like, so what are you doing? And he's like, turn key. And I go, what the heck is that? <laughs> and he explained it to me. And then I think we each had like seven beers in Mexico mm -hmm. one day in the pool. And he was like, I, I remember I said to him, I was like, I can't do that. He goes, you're full of shit. <laughs> And I was like, what do you think? He goes, that's what I thought until I went out and did it. You can do it. You just need to go home and do it. And uh, that was it. I mean, that's the story about how I get into turnkey. So now it's about 40% of our business. Um, we've built and sold um, over 30 uh, new duplexes and spec houses to our investors. And that's uh, probably the thing I'm most excited about, about the future of our business um, is continuing to grow that and continue to, to do a good job of it. So that's where we are. We're in... Uh, seven local markets in Pennsylvania. Uh, we do deals in um, Ohio, uh, New York, and Maryland. Wow. What an incredible story. So I didn't know the first half, I know the turnkey stuff, but I didn't realize how big of a team you have. Yeah. It's incredible. You've scaled such a big team. That's kind of one of my questions. So like, tell us how you went about doing that, You know, scaling to this large organization in the, the real estate space, what it took, and what you've learned building this large team? Um, wow, that that is uh, a loaded a question. <laughs> it, it really is, and I think the the reason um, I pause before I answer that is, I mean, I think you guys have seen this. Like this scale is a dirty word. Um, yeah. it gets thrown around in our industry, and everybody gets caught up in this this concept of scale. And, and I think it, it really needs to be defined um, at a personal level for each and every person before they make the decision. Because mm -hmm. most often what scale means is that we're going to grow the business to grow the revenue. And the, the unfortunate part is if we don't do that responsibly, we also 10x our stress. We 10x our complexity. We 10x um, turnover. We 10 X all of the wrong things so true. and we maybe two X our revenue. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, um, so I, I did that. I accidentally scaled because I was in love with volume and it was, you know, it was, you know what it's like when yeah. you go to meetups or people talk to you, how many deals do you do? Yep. You know, it almost what we should ask is say, how many days are you off a week? <laughs> like, you had hair, right? You had hair, right? Before you started. Yes, that. <laughs> like I did. I, I had like a mullet before I got into real estate. And now this is what you get, right? This is like a week's full work week of, of growth. Yeah. But um, so I, I accidentally scaled because I, I fell in love with the vanity of volume. Mm -hmm. And so I hired a bunch of people because I was like, well, I can't do all the work. So I need to hire other people. But I would hire a bunch of smart people and then I would tell them how to do everything, mm. um, which doesn't work. Smart people like the freedom to be challenged to solve problems on their own. Right. So early in my career, I think it was about two times. There was about a four to five year cycle where I burned relationships with good people because I was a horrible leader. Mm. And I think that's the biggest mistake that people make mm -hmm. when they decide to scale is they don't they don't define what their definition of scale means mm -hmm. and why they're doing it. And everybody, like it's the buzzword now, like integrator, COO, integrator, COO. Mm -hmm. And everybody is, is eager to hire this person. And, you know, there's really good job descriptions out there for those folks. And we can have cool things like KPIs for those people. But one, one piece of advice that I would give to anybody that's considered scaling is one uh, reconsider mm -hmm. Two, <laughs> really figure out what the motivating factor is behind it. Mm -hmm. Three, I would say is as soon as you're done filling out the COO's job description, you better fill out the CEO job description. What are you now going to do since you're not selling or mm -hmm. buying or right. project managing or property managing. Mm -hmm. Because if if you intend to retain some of or most of that responsibility, you're 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 gonna ruin your people. It's 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 not the effective way to lead people. You got to give them freedom, you got to trust them, you got to allow them to fail, and you have to start to 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 have a diminishing role in the day-to-day. -day. Mm. Um, so th that's 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 the mistake that I made. Um, it was really hard when I got halfway through scaling, I, I wanted to give up. Uh -huh. um, but I, I had a handful of really good people that 
I wasn't willing to, to, to quit on. So I said, I'm going to figure it out. And, you know, I was lucky enough to be in CG to be around some people that have been through that and they right. knew how to lead and they knew how to grow teams. So I said, listen, it's not impossible to do. I just need to be willing to put in the work. And I am. And, and I did. And that work was different, though, than than what it looked like when I started the company, because it, like leading and managing are very two different things. Yep. Mm -hmm. And I was good at managing. I was I was a really good worker. I could comp a house quicker than you could bat an eye. <laughs> but I was a horrible trainer. Yeah. I was a horrible coach. I didn't trust anybody's decision making. And those all made me very, very bad leader. And um, at, when I started to try, when I started to get better at figuring that out, everything became easier. We started doing more deals. It started requiring less effort. Um, we started making more money. Um, I started employing better people for longer. Mm -hmm. They were happier. And um, I, I think that's a pretty good example. If you were to have a peek at our organization today, um, I really don't participate in the day-to-day -day at all. Mm -hmm. um, my real involvement is quarterly meetings and I have a 90 minute one-on-one -on -one with my COO once a week. And, um, that's created a ton of opportunity for the people here. They've been able to grow and take over a lot of the responsibility that I used to monopolize. And now it's freed me up to go do some things. You know, we talked a little bit about some of the stuff that I have going on outside of this business. And, um, that's been really fun for mm -hmm. me to go out and be able to do new stuff and mm -hmm. travel a little bit and, um, every time I get a chance to, to go out and coach and teach somebody else, I, I learn about twice as much as, as what I'm teaching while I'm, while I'm going through that process. So yeah. that's been my experience with scale. I made a lot of mistakes. I feel like I learned from them. And, uh, as a result, I'm, I think a, a better leader today. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I would say we've done the exact same yeah, thing. Yeah, it's like hearing our story too. <laughs> yeah. uh, I was able to keep my hair, but the, uh, but uh, it's getting a lot grayer if uh, you haven't noticed. But the uh, give it some time. Yeah. Give it some time. <laughs> the uh, would you do it all over again, or would you do it something different? Like I was oh man, uh, knowing what you know now, I guess. I would have done some yeah. things differently, but I'm I, just I would do it over again because yeah. the net result is amazing. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a better father. I'm a better husband. Um, I'm a better person. I'm a better friend. And all of that happened, you know, and you think about it, like most people that have extraordinary stories um, at some point hit rock bottom mm -hmm. and rock bottom looks a little bit different for everybody else. Right. And my rock bottom was about halfway through that. Mm -hmm. um, and I think as a result, it forced me to reconsider some of the things that I had been doing for so long that appeared to be successful. I mean, I was making a lot of money, selling a bunch of homes. I could drive whatever car I wanted to. I lived in the house I always wanted. Um, and, and, and that became, you know, how most people measured happiness or success, but inside I was unhappy. Mm -hmm. And that's what forced me to, to maybe consider making a change and doing things differently. And slowly but surely, as I started to make those changes, um, I would see a, a difference, a difference in me, a difference in the way that people responded to me, um, a difference in turnover. So it's, it's kind of like, um, you know, basic training, I think was one of the hardest things I ever did in the military. Mm -hmm. I would do that over again, even though it's, <laughs> it really stunk the high heaven because of, I don't know any other way to, to learn the lessons that I learned about myself and how important a team is without going through that. Um, but I would, I would do some things differently. I would probably shut up a lot sooner and listen a lot better earlier. Mm -hmm. um, and I would, I would study the art of humility um, very early in my career because for me, that's been the one thing um, that that when I've when I've come across great leaders, it, it's every single time it's their number one characteristic is is their their humility. Yeah, right. that's totally awesome. agree. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, and we've seen we've we've had some recent interviews, and like well, you can see that some that people haven't. I don't know. They, they don't carry that, and you can mm -hmm. see the ones though that have been really successful that are happier. Um, have totally, that humility. For sure. humility. Yeah. But, yeah. Larry, you have so much going on. And uh, how do you manage the family, 
work-life balance. I, mean, I see you, you know, with your wife and your kids, and you spend all this time with them. Your your wife is super also incredible and supportive of you, you yeah. know, and all that you do. But how do you manage it all? Um, Man, so one way is I, I'm surrounded by extraordinary people that are very, um, they give me a lot of grace. Um, so I think, you know, what we see a lot, especially on social media or just our, 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 the visible portion of a lot of people was only oftentimes, um, a little snippet of what's actually going on. So my, my life is actual chaos, <laughs> but I'm very fortunate to have extraordinary people at the office that, mm-hmm. that manage our business. Um, my wife is the, the COO of our home. She mm-hmm. keeps all of our kids, um, doing what they're supposed to do. She gets them off to school. She, she makes sure that they're being, you know, just good, good, compassionate, understanding people. Um, and I have a personal assistant that coordinates all of my chaotic travel. Um, so I literally don't, they, I, I, I don't know that I communicated with you about the scheduling of this podcast. I think you probably had some people that talked to Lauren on my team and it got it got scheduled, which is awesome, right? Yeah. I had, oh, I I often say, I said, I just want to show up and talk. <laughs> if that's possible, I'm in. And um, so nearly everybody um, that I have that's in my life gives me the ability to just show up and talk. <laughs> and that's that's given me a ton of freedom because I don't I don't have to to think about stuff. I can go, I can show up. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I can sort of, you know, take the situation. Like you were like, Hey, is there prep? Sean sent me an email about how to prepare for this. I glanced at it for 30 seconds, but when he was like, you know, are you ready? I'm like, yeah, let's go. <laughs> I'll, I'll just figure it out. We just and, forgot uh, a kid on the <laughs> one child on the, the bio. It's, it's, it's no big deal. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's, you know, people say all the time that it's all about the people, but I think there's a long description that comes along with that. Yeah. You know, deals and houses and finances and rehabs mm-hmm. and offers are yep. simple. People are very complex human beings that need to be nurtured and loved and managed and encouraged and corrected and uh, inspired and motivated. And, um, I just, I'm very fortunate that I'm allowed to do that stuff and I'm not restricted by, you know, a lot of the mechanics of being a dad or being a father um, or being a husband or being a business owner. And I'm able to just like love on people and inspire them and motivate them. And um, everybody else kind of cleans up the mess that's left behind. And turns out that there's a lot of good stuff that comes out of that too. So I manage it by just doing my very best to find the best possible people that I can, and then creating an atmosphere and a personal relationship with them that makes them never want to leave. Yeah. And um, sometimes I fail at that. I mean, we lose people. Um, it hurts me each and every time, but um, I do whatever I can to, to treat people in a manner uh, that makes them think twice or 10 times mm-hmm. before they would ever want to go somewhere else. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Let's let's switch gears a little bit because I know we're as we're recording this, you know, we're living in a pretty interesting time, uh, especially in real estate. So, I just want your opinion. You, mm-hmm. I'm sure. The, so the last recession, I don't, I don't know if you you were already in real estate or you're still. Yeah, in the car yeah, business. yeah. I was yeah. I was right in the middle of that. Two thousand five. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, just what are you doing uh, today to prepare, you know, for what's coming or what we're in right now, and then uh, you know, kind of. Where do you see things headed? Um, and, you, and it's, I understand there's obviously mm-hmm. on a national level, but then in, in your market specifically, but mm-hmm. just tell us what you're seeing. I know you're, you're connected with a lot of people. So I just want your uh, viewpoint with the listeners on kind of what you're doing to protect your business. And then um, where you see things are headed. Yeah, it's, it's a great question. And I think it's something that's the, that, that people should be talking about more. Like everybody's very quick to observe the market mm-hmm. um, and to just kind of let things happen where I think really what we should be doing as real estate investors is um, doing our best to adjust mm-hmm. um, to what's happening now and, and plan for, because, you know, I think what we saw post COVID, we all knew it was a temporary cycle. Mm-hmm. And too many people were just caught up in like, oh, I can sell to the hedge funds and I can do all this stuff and didn't really 
stare the brutal facts in the face that at some point that that's going to come to an end and we should plan for it. Right. Right. And now that we're in what we're in now, which is a, re, it's, it's almost like a real estate excluded recession. It's, you know, you got all this inflation and all this other stuff's happening and real estate's sort of been protected so far, which was much different than what we saw in 2008 real estate was, was the, 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 the proponent. Yeah. 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 That, that, that generous. So it was the first thing to fall. So what we're doing is being sure not to overreact. Mm -hmm. um, we're paying close attention to what we think are indicators of what's to come. So I think what we're seeing in the market today is not a true testament of the market. It's an indicator of what will probably end up being a normalized market. Mm -hmm. So it's funny. I was talking to somebody the other day and we were talking about what we had to do because they're, they're still buying homes, but now their disposition or sales process is three times as long. So we started digging in and we said, you know, what are the three or four things that we have to start doing to sell homes quicker? And you know what? They were the exact same things you had to do in 2019 to sell a house, mm -hmm. mm. right? You actually mm -hmm. had to market it. You had to build a, <laughs> yeah. you had to build a relationship. It had to, to be a high quality renovation. It had yeah. to be priced strategically so that it made good long-term sense to the investor or the homeowner to buy it. And it was funny because we finished that process and they were like, this is awesome. This is cutting edge. This is cutting so edge. innovative. And <laughs> I didn't want to ruin that for him, but I get off the phone and I was like, that's everything we had to do in 2018. If we wanted to even think we could sell a house, like everybody's freaking out because it's dude, my days on markets like 25. I'm like, if you sold a house 25 days on the market in 2015, <laughs> mm -hmm. you would have had your own television show. Yep. Right. So it's things are sort of back to normal. Like in order for an investor to buy a house, it's got to be a deal. Mm -hmm. What's a deal look like? You know, for turnkey buyers, it's got to be cash flow and there's got to be the opportunity for appreciation. And they, they want some type of tax advantages, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, where for a period of time during COVID, they were just buying it because they, they had excess money that they wanted to deploy to right. pull out of the stock market or, you know, so it's, it's, it's gotta be a deal. It's gotta make sense. And you have to actually work to prospect and put the right house in front of the right buyer under the right circumstances. So depending on your market, those details of how that gets done will change a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, but that's what we've noticed is that the wind was at our back for two and a half years and now there's a bit of a, a headwind that's that's blowing in our face and it's making things a little harder. Um, so we're just doing generally good business practices, mm -hmm. which is, to, you know, to, to market a property, to build relationships, <laughs> right. to stay in front of people. Um, and as long as you're doing that, uh, we haven't really seen much of, of a change mm -hmm. um, here. We, we have noticed it's gotten easier to buy homes. Our lead count is up. Um, our acquisitions contracts mm. are up. And I think that's because some of the investors that haven't maybe made the changes that they need to, or just backed away from the market and said, Hey, I'm going to wait until this cools down. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's been um, a, a, di a diminishing amount of investors that are actively playing ball right now for one of two or three reasons. And that's given the opportunity for people that are, you know, consistent enough and, 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 and solid enough as an operator with good people in process that they can capitalize on that market share right now. And that's a little bit of what we're seeing. Yeah. yeah. Are you, are you adjusting your numbers at all? Are you on the um, we're, 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 we, we are. No. no, the short, the short answer is, is we're, we're not adjusting what we, cause we always based our, uh, you know, um, acquisitions off of real numbers. Mm -hmm. I, I got to tell you, there was someone in a, uh, a group conversation that I was in that when the market started to change, they did a really good thing. And they just said, listen, I'm going to call all of my buyers and we're just going to talk what's going on. How do you feel? You know, what are you planning on doing the next 90 days? How can I better serve you? And they had one of their buyers share with them their acquisitions model for the last two years. And it was ARV minus reno. Hmm. <laughs> and what they found was, and they were in a market where their, their average sale price was like north of $600,000. Mm -hmm. So if they saw a 3%, 4% increase in value month over month, and they held the property through construction for six months, it would go up 
15 to 20% in Jeez. value, wow. their profit was created. I mean, it's, it's the old buy and hold yeah. method, yeah. except they hold it for six months, not six years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So they said, what we're doing now is we're not projecting for appreciation. We're buying and we have to account for profit. And that's why their offers went down 60, $70,000 from what they were paying before. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we, we've, we've never, I mean, we enjoyed some crazy, you know, uh, prices that stuff we would put on the market would sell for right. well over, yeah. but we treated it as a luxury. We didn't mm -hmm. say that's the new ARV. We simply said, Hey, it's sold at our projected ARV and we happened to get a premium. Mm -hmm. So we, we've, we didn't change our numbers, but we're paying, we're making sure that our construction budgets, you know, we, we can't afford to go over and right. get bailed out. Um, on the backside, because you could just, if you went $25,000 over budget the last two years, you could just raise the price $25,000. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we, we really know that we got to be good at buying the right property. And then whatever assumptions we make when we buy that, we have to be very disciplined to operate within those parameters so that when we go to sell it, we make the money we deserve. Yeah. Cool. Love that. I've heard a lot of people are really focusing on dispositions and mm -hmm. really like you mentioned, revamping those, those departments, or they're just having to do work. Which is, <laughs> Market them right. <laughs> just, uh, you know, as much as they were putting on right. acquisitions, they, they do it on, on dispo as well. But. That's yeah. a, that's a good point. We, I, I've said this now, I don't know, a dozen times. And I think it's something people should, 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 should get stamped on their desk. And that's to treat buyers the way that we've been treating sellers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, we really covet those seller relationships. We nurture them. We mail them 16 times. We cold call them. We text them. We door knock them. We do all of that stuff. And then it was like, oh, buyers, we're just going to let them know it's for sale and they can fight over it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that's you. You now need to treat sellers the way that we've been treating buyers. That's the easiest way to explain it because people go, oh, OK, I get it. Right. Because if you ask people what their marketing and acquisition strategy is, it's this five page syllabus of all this crazy ninja stuff. And then you go, what's your dispo process looks like? And it's like this. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. It's, it's this underwhelming <laughs> piece of, of equipment. And um, that's that's really what people have to do if they if they've taken their eye off the ball. And I think everybody got a little lazy. It got easy. Yeah. It was hard not to. So and frankly, if you were putting all that work into Dispo, it might have been a waste of time. But you couldn't forget or completely abandon those practices. Otherwise, right now, it'd be like starting from scratch mm -hmm. and it'll take you three to six months to get back into Absolutely. the swing up. Right. Yeah. yeah. So what's next for Mr. Brewer? Like what's your. Uh, Five to ten. We talked a little bit before we, we started recording, but what, what's kind of your next? What are you, what are you doing personally? For um, so I, I went through a pretty, um, I guess you could call it a pretty revealing exercise with uh, my business coach um, about two years ago. And we've, we've been working on it really hard for me to come up with my core purpose or what a lot of people consider to be their why. Mm-hmm. Because as I, you know, really exited my business, um, not by 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 sale, but by just by, um, you know, God's grace and allowing me to find the right people, um, I, I I wasn't sure what what I should be doing, mm -hmm. and um, what I discovered was my purpose was to leverage my years of experience, my knowledge, and willingness to lead people to have a positive impact on as many lives mm -hmm. that I can. And I do that by having a strong belief in myself and faith mm -hmm. in other people. So once I got that clear, it actually gives me goosebumps. That's how yeah. I know that I got to the right place. When I would say it, I could say it from memory and it would, it, it, every time I do it, 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 um, it, it, it gets an emotional response. Mm -hmm. out of it. Mm -hmm. So I, I started just doing crazy stuff, like, like going and speaking at meetups and, you know, the mastermind group that we were in, um, Jason and, and Leon and Frank said, man, we'd love to have you part of the leadership team. And I kind of ran that through my purpose filter and I was like, that fits Yeah, and I'll do it. And, you know, I've had the opportunity to, to, to present either a keynote or a main stage 90 minute presentation, like 
four out of the last six meetings and it, it, it like, it really, really felt good. Mm -hmm. And then I started doing, um, EOS empire implementations with Gary and Susan Harper's company at sharper business solutions. And I really love that. And then as a result of all this, I had these people calling me saying, Hey, you know, your story is amazing. And I'm at the 30% mark of where it sounds like you were five years ago. Will you help me get through that? Mm -hmm. And, um, I've also realized it's really hard for me to say no to people. <laughs> So I think what, what happens next for me is um, when I close my eyes and I imagine what Eric's 100% looks like, I actually see myself standing on a stage with a group of people around me and beside me and a crowd of three to 10,000 people. That's awesome. That's amazing. That's and awesome. Um, I don't know what that looks like or what the details of that are, but anything that seems to sort of align with that, I just move in that direction and trust that it's, if it's not the right thing, it's, it's the right thing for that particular season of my life. Yeah. So I've, I'm writing a book. Um, I have a book that'll be coming out um, in about the next four months. Um, and then I'm immediately starting another one after that. The first book that I'm writing um, is about novations. Um, it's something that I accidentally stumbled on 10 years ago when the market crashed and FHA became the most popular form of financing in my market. I was searching for a way to get around FHA seasoning and discovered novations. And over the last 11 years, I've developed a process that allows you to wholesale, basically retail properties to retail buyers. And uh, I think you guys were in CG when I presented on mm -hmm. it for yes. the first time. Yep. And there was like 50 people waiting for me outside the door and they <laughs> bum rushed me. And then um, I just got to the point where there was such a demand for it, where I either had to say no, or I had to hire people to help me. Um, I've built out an entire curriculum. There's like 20 hours of training video. There's 30 documents. I, I built a whole course around it that has over 234 paying members now. Wow. Um, so that kind of stuff, right. And then I'm going to just take my journey and say, what did I learn when I was 22 about business? What did I learn about real estate when I got in at the age of 28? What did I learn about leadership when I messed up? And I'm just going to document all that stuff and then try and create maybe some, some guardrails for, for people to learn from so that, I mean, I, I can tell you like CG saved my professional life. Mm -hmm. And it yeah. was only because when I got there, I had all this crap going on that I was so worried and stressed over. And there was three to five people that for the three to five things that I needed, I could really, you know, um, leverage those relationships. And it, it, it helped me tremendously. I don't know where I would be without you know, those relationships today. Yeah. And, um, not everybody has access to that. Not everybody, you know, can travel to go to a mastermind. Not everybody even knows that they exist. Mm -hmm. Not everybody's outgoing enough. I mean, you know what it's like, it's, there was mm -hmm. literally forced connection. They had to make Sean and I pick our chairs up <laughs> and look at each other in the eyes. I, I didn't, I didn't love that. I gotta be honest. I hated that. I was like, this is stupid, Yeah. but it turns out it was, it was really, really beneficial. So I'm, I'm going to try and do whatever I can to help um, anybody from the age of, I did this the other day, anybody from the age of 13, which I think is a super critical point in our lives mm. where we start to make decisions that are difficult to recover from. I think when you're 14, if you go out and you get into trouble or you start running around with the wrong people, you can end up in a bad spot mm -hmm. and it can take you 10 to 15 years to recover. So I want to I, I want to start working on leadership and 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 coaching and curriculum that starts to impact parents' ability to be better parents, business owners to be better leaders, coaches to be better coaches. Um, and I don't know what that looks like, but I think when I'm done, it'll be pretty cool. Ah, I love that's that. amazing. And that, that's that's so a much, good segue, actually, yeah. for the next question. So if you were just starting out and could go back into your early twenties, what advice would you give to yourself? Um, talk less and listen more. Mm -hmm. um, Love that. I just, you know, I'm a bit of a hard charging maverick style personality. And particularly, I think in our younger years, we, we tend to be a know-it-all, mm -hmm. even though we really don't know anything. <laughs> and, um, 
I just think I would listen more and I would, I would study the, the art of humility much earlier. It'd be the first thing that I would invest in is learning how to be humble, um, which comes naturally, but it's also really hard to balance humility and the assertiveness that it takes to be an entrepreneur, right? Like how do you be humble and have the audacity to think that you can run a business? The two don't seem like they match, (laughs) but they do. It just takes it. It takes work. You got to be able to turn one on and one off at the right time. So, um, and then I I think, you know, the last piece of advice is, is just, man, just go out and build relationships, Mm -hmm. like make it like the most important thing. Um, I read a really good book about a year ago called who not how Mm -hmm. a pretty popular Mm -hmm. book. And, you know, the one takeaway I had from that is like everything we want in life is only one relationship away. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you just never know what that relationship is. Um, so for me, I've tried to be just more outgoing um, and try and, you know, build relationships every chance that I get, even with complete strangers. And a lot of people think I'm a weirdo because I'm doing that. Like, why is this guy talking to me? He came up to me in the middle of the grocery store. I'm like, hey, man, I'm just I'm just building my one new relationship today. It's my KPI. Um, but uh, That's awesome. it's awesome. It's- it's paid off tremendously for me. I mean, I have friends and, and close relationships now with people that I would have walked by and not even acknowledged five years ago. And now some of those people are my very best friends. Yeah, that's cool. That's um, awesome. we're, we're reading uh, Ed Milet's uh, One More right now. The as, power as a, of One More. The power as a company. And that, that he mentions that in there, just the, uh, you're one way, like you're one step away from, you know, um, a different life by just uh, like one more conversation, one more relationship, one more phone call. Mm-hmm. So a lot of that's in there, but I love it. Yeah. It's, yeah. Uh, I actually, I bought that book. I haven't read it yet though. Cause yeah. uh, I heard a couple people bring it up and I'm always, you know, like when you see movies at the movie theater on the trailer <laughs> yeah. and you're like, that's an awesome movie. And then when the time comes for me to watch a movie, they all look like crap. <laughs> so I started writing down when I go to the movie theater, I'll see, went, keep an eye on this movie when it comes out. And yeah. I do the same with books. When someone says, yeah, I read this book. I go right to my phone and, and I buy it. And then, so I have a library of like, I listen to books that I'm not disciplined enough to read, yeah. but uh, I have like 40 books in there <laughs> that I've bought that I'll, I'll get around to reading. But when someone I trust says, I read this and I liked it. I'm okay. Then I'm going to read it too. Yeah. We're the same so. way. And so it's inspiring to hear all that, that you're doing. And um, yes. I'm glad you're, you're, you're making such a big contribution mm-hmm. and not just uh, sitting on the beach in Florida, which I'm sure you can do a little <laughs> bit of that too, but I, I don't think you'd be fulfilled. So I think you, uh, it's awesome to hear you doing all that. So. I feel like I got about six years left. Yeah. Six years of like, I'm actually, I'm at like this, this, uh, point where I have enough experience and knowledge to to really have an impact, and I have enough energy left to where I'm not on the downside yet. Yeah. So I feel like if I can maximize this next five to six years, where I can leverage my experience and professional maturity, and I'm not tired yet, um, I can get a lot done. Yeah. And uh, I'm going to go hard, like really hard, for the next five years. And Hopefully what happens is the momentum that I create over these next five years will allow me to sit on the beach in Florida in five to six years or and, not. And make those but, connections on the beach. <laughs> and, and makes those connections on the, you can do a lot with, with social media these days. So, um, but no, it's, uh, thank you for saying that. Yeah, I no, appreciate it. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so how can people get a hold of you? Uh, how, uh, you know, social media, um, say the innovations, because I think you are the innovations king. So how can they learn more about that? And, and uh, you can, like that. Uh, a couple different ways. Um, if you want to learn about innovations, you can go to the brewer, not the, I'm sorry. It's just brewer method.com. Uh, it'll give you a lot of information about what innovations are, what they're not. Cause I can tell you, it's not what people remember them to be 10 years ago, um, our version of, of uh, Novations, it does not include any renovations, which is the best possible revenue for me because renovations is super hard. Mm-hmm. Um, if you want to find me on social media, you can just go to Eric underscore Brewer underscore invest on Instagram. 
Um, and then I have a link tree on there, which if anybody has any interest in following me on Facebook or TikTok or any of that stuff, um, you can find me on social media. But those are the two best ways to, to find me. I'm pretty active on social media. I try and get back to like, I get a lot of messages and um, stuff like that. So um, I respond to all of them, might not be right away, but I, I still am able to respond to, to questions and inquiries. Novations is like crazy right now. It must like the, the secret has gotten out. <laughs> and I think um, with the market changing right now, people are searching for that next mm-hmm. thing yeah. um, that gives them an advantage. So I'm, I'm getting, I mean, we, we, I, I did not have the brewer method a year ago. Now there's 234 people that I've taught it to that are part of that community. And, uh, the last three months we've been adding over 30 people a month. It's crazy. So wow. with really no advertising, I, okay. I do, I talk about it a little bit on my personal social media, but we don't really run ads or do any of that stuff. So I've been very blessed to meet a lot of great people across the, the U S I got a guy that uh, lives in, in the Dominican Republic or Puerto Rico or somewhere. And he invests in California uh, we got people in Canada. It's crazy wow. uh, where I've met all these people from all across the the, the U S and even further, but um, yeah, that's the best way to find me. I'm pretty easy to find on social media. Awesome. awesome. We'll, we'll put it all in the show notes and uh, all the links. And uh, I appreciate you doing this and anything we can ever do for you, please let us know. And I think you added a ton of value for. Yes, for absolutely. Listeners. It's amazing to see your journey and I can't wait to see the next five to six years where yeah. Eric Brewer will be. And invite us to your yeah your beach house so we can uh, go hang out and drink some beers again. So. <laughs> you can give me my next new great idea. Uh, inspired, by, inspired by Modelo. Yes. Uh, <laughs> that was a great trip, by the way. Back to Mexico. So, so we, 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 we spent a month. We spent all of July there. Um, this year. I saw it. I was yeah. like, Oh my God. So why yeah. they, oh, what a great time. That's a beautiful place. And I didn't know, I didn't even know that existed it, it, until it, we went down there. Yeah. yeah. So I have a weird, so I was, <laughs> I, I was conceived there is what my parents tell me. So I don't know, maybe I have a connection there or something. There's a, you have a special place in your heart. <laughs> yes. that you Mexico. That's right. awesome. So well, thanks again. Um, Absolutely. Every, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah. So everybody share this, um, you know, like it, please check out uh, the brewer And otherwise we'll see you all next week. See you everyone. See y'all. Thanks guys. You've been listening to Inside the Wolf's Den, an entrepreneurial journey with Sean and Joni Wolfswinkle. Tons of entrepreneurial podcasts are out there talking. Talk, talk, talking. But Joni and Sean are living it every single day. Their portfolio now includes many franchises and medium-sized businesses. We talk about the trials and motivators of successfully running a business. Join us again soon for another podcast. But until then, reach out on the website at InsideTheWolfsDen.com, on Facebook at InsideTheWolfsDen, on Instagram at InsideTheWolfsDen. We'll see you again soon. This is Inside the Wolf's Den. We'll see you next time.